just say thank you. Your kids, your spouse, your friends, your boss. You do so much for them. Why can't they just say thank you? What's the big deal? And it's so frustrating. But they won't change. So how do we let go of that anger that we feel towards them? In Hebrew, the word for thanks is toda. But that word also means to admit. Because when we say thank you, we're admitting that I had a need. I couldn't have done it without you. And you helped me. It's normal and courageous to ask for help. But for some people, admitting that they need help is admitting defeat. On some level, saying the words thank you feels like a weakness. And it's hard for them to admit that they can't do everything on their own. So if someone you know can't say thank you, just realize they're feeling weak. And instead of carrying around anger, let it go. Feel for them and experience peace. Good morning and welcome to Breakfast with Ellie. It is Wednesday, the 22nd day of June, the 23rd day of Sivan. The Torah portion is Shlach Hayom Yom Ravi'i, the fourth day, counting up toward Shabbos. We'll be learning the fourth Aliyah. And guess what? It's ucky and rainy here, so I decided to go to the beach. I mean, not literally, but, you know, here we are at our beach resort. All right. <laughs> All right, let's get started. Got a lot to cover today. Um, Let's start with the bracha on tzitzit. Get your two tzitzis out, and let's go. Are you ready? Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kiddushan Vemitzvotav Vitzivanu Al Mitzvah Tzitzit I'll debrate her. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kiddushanu B'mitzvotav V'tzivanu Al debrate Torah All right, Arini Mechabel Arini Mechabel Alay Mitzvah Tase Shel Ve'ahavta Lerea I take upon myself every single day to love my fellow friend in a very special way. All right, continuing our morning bracha. <laughs> Morasha, 
Now let us get our Sadaka money ready and give Sadaka. I put it in the pushki the Sadaka box. Okay. I put it in the pushki the Sadaka box. Oh, okay. I put oh. it in the pushki for someone else That's to keep. Yeah, I put it in the pushki the Sadaka box. I put it in the pushki the Sadaka box. I put it in the pushki for someone else to need. All right. Very good. Tzedakah has been given. And now let's say the Shema. Put your hand over your eyes. Shema Yisrael Adinah Yeloheinu Adinah And now, breakfast. Uh, super fruit. Looks like blueberries to me, but there's other stuff in it, it says. All right, are you ready? Grab your uh, things together. Baruch ata adinai lehena melech ha'olam shahakol v'yabidvorah. What are you having for breakfast? All right. And now, today in Jewish history. All right. Today is the day that after King Solomon's passing in the year 797 BCE, Ten of the twelve tribes of Israel, led by Yeruvalam uh, of the tribe of Ephraim, rebelled against King Solomon's son and heir, Rehovam. The land, the Holy Land, split into two kingdoms, the kingdom of Israel in the north, with Yeruvalam and as its king, and the city of Samaria as its capital, and the southern kingdom of Yehuda, Judah, with its capital, Jerusalem where Rehovoam ruled over the two tribes, Yehuda and Benjamin, that remained loyal to Beis David, the house of David. The spiritual center of the land, however, remained Jerusalem, where the holy temple built by Solomon stood and where everyone was obligated to make a three-time-a-year pilgrimage for the festivals of Pesach, Shuas, and Sukkos. Now, seeing this as a threat to his sovereignty, on the 23rd of Sivan, Yeruvalam set up roadblocks to prevent the people coming to Yerushalayim, in, introducing instead the worship of two idols in the form of gold calves, which he enshrined on the northern and southern boundaries of his realm. Do we never learn? The barricades remained in place, get this, for 223 years. Until Hosea ben Elah, the last king of the northern kingdom, had them removed on the 15th day of Av in the year 574. By then, the ten tribes residing there had already been expelled from the land in a series of invasions by various Assyrian and Babylonian kings. The last of these occurred in the year 556 when Shalmesag of Assyria completely conquered the kingdom of Israel, destroying its capital, exiling the last of the Israelites res residing there, and resettled the land with foreign peoples from Kutha and Bavel, Babylon. Uh, these people, known later as the Samaritans, assumed a form of Judaism as their religion, but were never they never accepted by they were never accepted by the uh, bulk of the Jewish people. Subsequently, they built their own temple on Mount Gerizim and became bitter enemies of the Jews. The ten lost tribes of Israel were never heard from again, awaiting the coming of Mashiach to be reunited with the Jewish people. It's an amazing story. If you want more, there's an essay called A Rift Across History at uh, Chabad.org. Today in the year 357, Haman's decree was counteracted. 
Even after Haman was hanged on the 17th day of Nisan, his evil decree to destroy, kill, and annihilate the Jews from young to old, infants and women in one day on the 13th day of the month of Adar still stood. Queen Esther pleaded with King Ahasuerus to annul the decree, but he insisted that a writ had been written in the king's name and sealed with the king's uh, seal, and that cannot be rescinded. Can you imagine <laughs> what you must think of yourself to do that? Instead, he suggested to Esther and Mordechai to inscribe regarding the Jews as you please and seal it with the king's seal. On the 23rd of 7, Mordechai drafted a royal decree giving the Jews the license to defend themselves and kill all who rise up against them to kill them and dispatched it to all 127 provinces of Ahasuerus' empire. Uh, that's really interesting. All right. Um, Today, the Rebbe, writes, the Rebbe writes that today is a most auspicious day when Hashem can fulfill all of our needs. It says in the Megillah that on this day, the scribes of the king wrote everything that Mordechai commanded. The king refers to Hashem. And the Rebbe says that we can write in heaven anything we want on this day. He says that we are all in control of our destinies and we control the entire world on this day and can decree whatever we want and everything will be done according to our will. All right? Uh, every Jew is a balabias of the entire world and, decree, and can decree whatever they want and everything is a done, done according to their will. This is absolutely Im Im imperative. Today we are encouraged to use this opportunity to our fullest to have written in the heavens that all our needs be fulfilled. Uh, this is an incredible opportunity to decree verbally for one another and ourselves that those who need blessings should receive them because of mamish immediately. We are the authors of our own destiny today for ourselves and for others who need our blessings. All right. Uh, let us all write. And we will be answered. Mainly, let's stay focused and ask for the ultimate bracha with the perfect and ultimate redemption with Mashiach now mamish. We should all receive the brachas that we need. in physically and spiritually both together. in a good that is seen and revealed. with joy and gladness of heart so we can fulfill our ultimate destiny, the ultimate reason that we've been put on this earth to bring the entire world to know Hashem, Ein Eid Milvadei, that there is none other than Hashem. All right? So if you uh, need any more information on what to do or how to do it, today is the day to ask for it. All right? Uh, it is also the art site of Rabbi Yaakov Pollock. In 1525, he was the first uh, first a rabbi in Krakow, Poland, then in first in Prague and then in Krakow, and established a large yeshiva that attracted thousands of students. He devised a new method of Talmudic study called pilpul, with the goal of stimulating the intellectual abilities of his students. Although many scholars of subsequent generations originally opposed this method, Rabbi Yaakov succeeded in bringing about a renewal of Talmudic study in Poland, which became the major Torah center for the next four generations. And Pilpul is used up until and including today. All right, there was a big win for yeshivas yesterday. The Supreme Court ruled that religious schools cannot be excluded from a main program that offers tuition aid for private education, a decision that could ease religious organizations' access to taxpayer money. The most immediate effect of the court's 6-3 to three decision beyond Maine will be next door in Vermont, which has a similar program. But the outcome could also fuel a renewed push for school choice programs in some of the 18 states that have so far not directed taxpayer money to private religious education. So we'll see how that plays out. All right. 
Okay. Um, one more thing you see up on the screen over here. In preparation for Gimel Tammuz, the third day of Tammuz, when the Rebbe uh, left us physically from this world, make writing to the Rebbe meaningful and relatable to you and your children. Uh, there are three websites, uh, four websites, I'm sorry, four websites, uh, kids.deher.org. You can see it right here. Spotify is deher.org slash kids slash Spotify, Apple Podcasts, uh, or Google Podcasts. And these are all things on how to connect to the Lubavitcher Rebbe before the yard site coming up. Another way to connect to the Rebbe is through the responsa. Hayom Yom for today, the 23rd of Sivan. Hard drive is being particularly slow today. Forgive me. So humans are the most intelligent creatures that we know, right? Not always. Sometimes we can observe the behavior of certain animals and see tremendous intelligence. Specific animals are like that. And then we can behave, or then we can observe the behavior of certain people and see that there is no intelligence there at all. It's interesting that in the lexicon of Hasidic terminology, the Yetzirah, the evil inclination, is termed the Nefesh Habahamis, the animal soul. And today's Hayoim Yoim is, uh, records a life lesson, a life's lesson that the Rebbe Maharash uh, taught his son on this subject. Says the Rebbe Maharash, when we talk about the animal instinct inside of you, the evil inclination, we don't call it an animal because it's dumb because it is, it isn't always. Sometimes there's an evil voice in your head and it's very clear to identify it as evil and you say, no, that's wrong. Right off the bat you can tell that this is a bad idea. It's immoral. It's the wrong thing to do. Just at face value you can see it immediately. But sometimes your animal soul is a little more subtle and cunning. Sometimes, says the Rebbe Maharaj, your animal soul can behave like a sly and cunning fox. So sometimes there can be a voice in your head that at face value appears to be coming from a very good place. Perhaps there is a voice inside of you that's urging you to perform a mitzvah. What could, be poss what could possibly be wrong with that? There could be. Sometimes doing the right thing at the wrong time is actually the wrong thing. And a cunning animal soul will do that sometimes. If your animal soul feels that to get the better of you, he's got to make a more nuanced and uh, cunning, deceptive argument, your animal soul can and will do that. So then the question becomes, so how do you know? If your animal soul is capable of being so tricky, how do you know which way to go? How do you know to identify what is the right thing and what is the wrong thing? The Rebbe Maharaj continues saying to his son, 
here's the litmus test. Here's what you should do. When you hear a voice in your head and you want to try and determine where is this coming from? Is this a good thing? Or is this a deceptive argument by my cunning animal soul? Play out the argument in your head. Say, where I, if I go ahead now and act upon this voice, act upon this urge, if it will bring positive results, if it will make you do the right thing, if it will make you be a better person, then chances are it's coming from a good place. But if it's just kind of a fancy type of uh, uh, argument, but doesn't really necessarily bring to actual results, concrete results, positive results, then you want to stick. Then you want to stay away. You want to take a step back. After hearing this from his father, the Rebbe Rashab commented, "Until then, until I heard this from my father, I had never imagined that there could be a pious or religious animal soul." When I was done with this uh, uh, lesson, I learned that not only is it possible for there to be a fruma or a pious animal soul, but there could even be a Hasidic animal soul. An animal soul that on the outside dresses up and looks like a Hasid, but on the inside is self-serving and uh, not going to take you uh, to a good place. So you've got to know how to probe deeper and make that distinction. Okay. All righty. Time for breaking news. Well, it's been a long day. Today, yesterday rather, was the longest day of the year, the summer solstice. Technically, it's an astronomical event that occurs when the sun reaches its most northern point in the sky. The sages of ancient days were well aware of astronomy and the cycle of the seasons. The Talmud even records their calculation of the seasons. It says in the Gemara, in the Talmud, Shmuel stated, the summer solstice only occurs either at the end of one and a half or at the end of seven and a half hours of the day or the night. The winter solstice only occurs at the end of four and a half or ten and a half hours of the day or the night. The duration of the season of the year is no longer than 91 days, seven and a half hours. And the beginning of one season is removed from that of the other by no more than one half of a planetary hour. The NASA website supports the SAGE's calculations, which were established without sophisticated scientific equipment or a large budget. Perhaps it could be argued that the solstices are not so difficult to calculate, and any observant person could do so by simply counting. But on the days surrounding the solstice, the alteration of the length of days occurs in such minimal increments that it makes accuracy much more difficult. In fact, people don't even notice that the days are getting shorter until a month or so later. A fact noted elsewhere in the Talmud where it states, it has been taught, Rabbi Eliezer the Elder says, from the 15th of Av onwards, the strength of the sun grows less. The 15th of Av this year corresponds to August Third. Look at that. Can you imagine? Well, it's been a long, been a long, been a long day. Uh, a powerful earthquake has just struck the mountains in East Afghanistan, uh, killing at least a thousand people and injuring 1,500 more in one of the deadliest earthquakes in decades. An earthquake of magnitude 6.1 killed hundreds of people in Afghanistan early on Wednesday. At least 950 died and more than 600 were injured, according to disaster management officials. 
The toll is expected to grow as information trickles in from remote mountain villages. Buildings were reduced to rubble and helicopters were deployed in the rescue effort to reach the injured and fly in medical supplies and food. Wednesday's quake was the deadliest since 2002. It struck about 27 miles from the southeastern city of Coast, near the border with Pakistan, the US Geological Survey said. Most of the confirmed deaths were in the eastern province of Paktika. Haibatullah Akhundzada, the supreme leader of the ruling Taliban, offered his condolences in a statement. Mounting a rescue operation could prove a major test for the Taliban, who took over the country in August and have been cut off from much international assistance because of sanctions. The disaster comes as Afghanistan grapples with a severe economic crisis since the Taliban took over as US-led international forces withdrew following two decades of war. Many nations cut billions of dollars worth of development aid, though international agencies such as the United Nations still operate. A foreign ministry spokesman said Afghanistan would welcome international help. All right, uh, that death toll could rise as it just happened this morning. The Broadway League, which represents theater owners and producers across the country, are now. Hold on a second. Sorry about that. There we go. Huh. This first thing. It's not uh, grabbing the edge over here. Don't know why. All right. We'll, we'll work on that. Let's see why that's not working. All right. Uh, the Broadway League, which represents theater owners and producers across the country, announced Tuesday that all 41 theaters on Broadway will go mask optional for the month of July. In a statement, Charlotte uh, St. Martin, president of the Broadway League, said audience members are still encouraged to wear masks, but would not be forced to beginning July 1st. The policy is going to be reevaluated on a monthly basis going forward. Millions of people have enjoyed the unique magic of Broadway by watching the Tony Awards. Millions more have experienced Broadway live in theaters since we reopened last fall. We're thrilled to welcome even more of our passionate fans back to Broadway in the exciting 22-23 season that has just begun. The Broadway League announcement did not specify a reason for the policy change, but it does come as Mayor Adams and Health and Mental Hygiene Commissioner Dr. Ashwan Vassan announced Tuesday that the COVID risk alert had been downgraded from high to medium. Under the new designation, however, the department offers guidance on mask wearing, which says, wear a mask in public indoor settings where vaccine status is not known. Now, the number of new cases per 100,000 people is stable at 240.4 per day. There are currently 27 shows running in the 41 theaters on Broadway. Back in the start of May, Broadway theaters dropped the vaccine requirements for that audience members. Since Broadway reopened in um, 2021, sorry about that, uh, multiple productions have been affected by COVID outbreaks, with several individual performances canceled and some shows permanently closed. This month alone, high-profile stars, including the music man's Hugh Jackman, Funny Girl's Beanie Feldstein, have missed shows because they tested positive for COVID-19. As Gothamist reported this month, hundreds of Broadway's custodians, elevator operators, and restroom attendees who have not received pay increases despite new job demands during COVID are currently engaged in a contract battle with theater owners. Martha Arisizdabo, I'm sorry, Arisizdabo, who has worked for the Schubert Company, please forgive me for mispronouncing your name, has worked for the Schubert Company for over 12 years and currently works at the Ambassador Theater as a custodian in the morning and manager's assistant during the shows in the evening said that she and other workers lived in constant fear of getting sick because of their proximity to so many people. We go to work every day and see people getting sick, not just in the outside world, but our co-workers. She added that one of the only things that gave her some comfort was the fact that the theaters were strict about people wearing masks during the performances. Part of her responsibilities has been making sure people keep their masks on. Right now, the job is a lot harder because the amount of disinfecting 
uh, and cleaning we have to do because of COVID protocols, it's also incredibly ch challenging to make sure that audience members are wearing their masks properly and continually throughout the show. So um, as I said, it's too early. It's too early. Health ministry data in Israel showed that Israel saw 10,000 new cases yesterday. The second day in a row that the number has crossed the threshold since the start of April. There were 10,692 people diagnosed with the virus on Monday, with further 982 since midnight on Tuesday, taking the number of active cases in Israel. Get this. Uh, the number of active cases in Israel to 60,622. Can you imagine? Uh, Shalom, Emmanuel. How are you this morning? The number of patients in serious condition also continued to rise, reaching 180, with 36 of them classified as critical. Good morning, Don from Texas. Just seeing all these people watching and listening. Israel is gearing up for another election after Prime Minister Naftali Bennett and his key coalition ally, Minister Yair Lapid, agreed to submit a bill to dissolve parliament, which was passed yesterday. Um, it triggers the election later this year, making this the fifth time Israelis will be going to the polls in under four years. The announcement followed weeks of mounting political uncertainty in Israel, but still came as a major surprise. A short statement from the Prime Minister's office said the move came after attempts to stabilize the coalition had been exhausted. The Bennett-Lapid government was sworn into office in June of last year, bringing an end to the premiership of Benjamin Netanyahu, which had lasted more than 12 years. I wonder, boys and girls and others, I wonder. Was was uh, was he right all along? And now a word from our sponsors. And now a word from our sponsors. PestProRiddle.com. PestProRiddle.com. Trusted by the best to keep away the pests. We are offering COVID-19 disinfection services. Mention this ad and get one month free service. Visit us at PestProRiddle.com. Tarzane Group, micro, miniature, and small orchids. Go to tarzanegroup.com or call Tomas at 305-440-0565. That's 305-440-0565. And order today. Visit Tomas and Yair at tarzanegroup.com. Micro, miniature, and small orchids. Beautiful in your home. Go to the website and read Tomas's orchid blog. And by Dina D. Design. Dina D. Design at gmail.com. Fine artwork, custom made to your specifications. Logos, wall hangings, Judaica. And you can even have something for your child's room. Dina D. Designs. Go to her Facebook or Instagram or call or text. Thank you very much to our sponsors. If you'd like to become a sponsor, please go right up here to where it says patreon.com slash the actors rabbi and you can contribute even only one dollar a month if you'd like but that'll help us bring this broadcast to you on a daily basis and cover our expenses be sure to thank your sponsors when shopping and mention breakfast with ellie when you're shopping there there might be discounts thanks for watching all right, patreon.com slash the actress rabbi or breakfast with Ellie dot live slash tip jar or use this handy QR code right there on the screen. All right, we asked the question yesterday after the Jewish people had witnessed the divine revelation of the giving of the Torah at Sinai and all the miracles, the going out of Egypt, and all those things that happened, how could their spiritual elite fall so low as to question God's omnipotence by coming back and giving a false report 
about conquering the land which Hashem told them to do? The answer is, it, it was specifically their heightened spiritual orientation that led them astray. They wished to experience life and pursue godliness unencumbered by the distractions of materiality. In the desert, they were protected by the clouds of glory, sustained by the manna and the well of Miriam. All their physical needs were fully attended to. All their time was spent in Torah study, meditation, prayer. They were repulsed by the notion of entering the real world where bread must be wrested from the earth and life cannot be a heavenly paradise. So the scouts described the land as one that consumes its inhabitants, fearing that once they entered the land, they would fall prey to its earthliness and no longer be spiritual beings. Now, their sentiments were echoed centuries later in the words of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who said, If a person plows when it's time to plow, sows when it's time to sow, reaps when it's time to reap, threshes when it's time to thresh, and winnows when it's time to winnow, what will become of the Torah? Indeed, this aspiration has inspired us to yearn throughout the ages for Mashiach, when the materiality of the world will no longer distort our spiritual focus. It is indeed commendable to yearn for such a time, as we've said. But this yearning must be balanced with humble submission to Hashem's plan for creation. The purpose of life is to live within the mundane reality and reveal the godliness concealed within it, to make this a home for Hashem by disseminating divine consciousness to the world. The spies in their generation weren't willing to carry out this mandate given at Sinai to bring heaven to earth and earth to heaven because they didn't recognize the advantage of entering the material world where God's essence can be found through fulfilling his mitzvahs on the physical plane and because they were afraid of the pitfalls accompanying this task. It was precisely this misconception that had to be proven wrong once and for all before entry into the land. It's very easy when we consider the wide range of the Torah's demands on our life and the effort we have to expend to fully fulfill them properly, to fall into the trap that Hashem is asking too much of us. After all, Torah seeks to govern every aspect of our life. Its myriad of details, even learning Torah seems impossible, for its measure is longer than the earth and it's wider than the sea, as our sages tell us. And on top of this, the Torah requires us to vanquish our inborn animal instincts, as we learned in the Yom Yom today, and resist the pervasive pull of society and its norms. How can the faint voice of the few that are faithful to Hashem be heard over the din of those who ignore Him? Strong arguments, to be sure, but upon every momentary reflect, upon even momentary reflection, they crumble. For even a human dispatcher, if he has any sense, will not give an emissary a charge too difficult for him to accomplish. And while a human dispatcher can err or err in the estimation of an emissary's capabilities, Hashem knows us better than we know ourselves. As our Creator, He's fully aware of both the strengths and weaknesses that we have. It's therefore inconceivable that he would assign us a task that we couldn't fulfill. Now, by failing in their mission, the spies ironically succeeded in a much more profound way. Their failure allowed the very value that they disregarded, Hashem's purpose of making this world into his home, to be accomplished more fully than their success ever could have the Rebbe's way of looking at everything positively. The ultimate way of making the world into Hashem's home is by revealing our own divine natures and thereby making Hashem's perspective, goals, and desires our own. When we do this, we follow Hashem's will, not only because we're told to, but because our own minds and hearts impel us to. The problem is that remaking ourselves over this way is a process of self-refinement, which is a long, hard work. It's much simpler to submit carte blanche to Hashem's will than to gradually refine our intellect and emotions by training them constantly to see through the world's materiality. 
But this is exactly what the spy sin enabled us to do in a straightforward manner. First of all, the spies succeeded in exciting the Jewish people about entering the land of Israel. Thanks to them, people heard from eyewitnesses that the land flowed with milk and honey. They didn't have to take God's promise on mere faith. Once they were shaken from their momentary doubt, they were swept up with the desire to enter the land. Their children carried this knowledge of the land's virtues when they joyously entered it with Joshua. The spies that Joshua sent were only for strategic purposes, since the people didn't need another report of the land's beauty and beneficial properties. Secondly, the very fact that the spies, as Jewish leaders, walked through the land, prepared it spiritually for the eventual entrance of the people as a whole. The spies' mission, therefore, had the immediate effect of the beginning of the conquest of the land and paving the way for the actual conquest. And thirdly, had the spies and their generation not sinned, the people would have indeed entered the land headed by Moses, who would have been led to a miraculous victory by Hashem's cloud of glory and pillar of fire. But then the victory and conquest would have been God's alone rather than the people's, aided by his constant support. Because of the spy sin, the land now had to be won by military prowess. But the ensuing victory would be the result of the people's efforts. And because they would fight for it, they would value it more than they would have had they received it only as a gift from Hashem. And finally, the spy's error taught, a, error taught us the invaluable lesson that we can indeed fulfill Hashem's mission. That we would never make the mistake of thinking that we don't measure up to his calling. So in this light, it was crucial that the spies should sin. It was the only way the objective of making the world into Hashem's home could be accomplished. The only way the historical process could proceed in exactly the best manner possible. Their real fault was not in what they did, but in the fact that they only focused on one side of the coin. Perhaps they can be forgiven for this, for it was the first time a generation was called out called upon to live out this paradox of yearning for heaven while toiling on earth, of acknowledging the importance of the self while abrogating in raw obedience. As our sages say, kol has cholos koshesem. All beginnings are difficult. In any case, the Rebbe says, we must learn from the spies the importance of both ardently aspiring to the spiritual life and humbly submitting to Hashem's desire to make this in world into his home. Attaining the proper balance between both of them, acting as self-interested agent and operating on blind obedience, those both have their drawbacks. Blind obedience has its pay place as the bedrock of our commitment to Hashem, but a life based solely upon it doesn't involve the entire person. Acting in our own interests allows Hashem's perspective to permeate our whole being, but doing so exposes us to the risk of letting our egos lead us astray. The goal, the ultimate goal, to remain aware of our super-rational and unconditional commitment to Hashem while making His reality our own. When we undertake the quest to manifest our divine dimension as Hashem's mandate, rather than our exercise in furthering our self-interests, that's when our mission is guaranteed to succeed. In the fourth Aliyah, we just learned yesterday that the people were punished, that they were not going to enter the land. And the details of this punishment are now reve revealed in the fourth Aliyah. The Israelites will wander in the desert for 40 years. During that time, all males over the age of 20, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb, would perish. The next generation would enter the Promised Land. The ten scouts who brought back the frightful report perished immediately. When the Jews were informed of Hashem's decision, they lamented and grieved. A group of people awoke the next day and decided to go it alone and enter the land of Israel, despite Moshe's warning that their plan would not succeed because it was not sanctioned by Hashem. This group was cut down and massacred by the Amalekites and the Canaanites. The Jews are now told that upon entering the land, an individual who pledges to bring a sacrifice must also bring an accompaniment consisting of a wine libation and a flower offering 
mixed with olive oil. <clears throat> heady, heavy stuff, right? Uh, tomorrow we will be doing Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, but for now, Shnaim Yomi. Oriolam comes and tells Moshe and Aharon in the following. He says, until when is this assembly, this evil assembly, they're coming now and they're complaining about me? Until when are they going to complain? I heard their complaints. Tell them, says Oriolam, Oriolam swears, whatever they said, that's what I'm going to do with them. In this desert, they wanted to die, they're going to piss away. And those children that they were worried about, those children are going to go into the land. He says, They're going to go now and they're going to greet the desert. They're going to travel the desert 40 years. For every day, so those Benaglim, those spies, went in to spy the land. For every day, there's going to be a year of ramifications. Pasuk says that the people that actually went in the spies, they all passed away. How did they pass away? That their tongue stretched into their stomachs and there were worms going into their intestines. And that was the way that they passed away. However, they lived. They lived. Moshe comes and reveals this news to B'nai Sel. And they start mourning. They got up in the morning and they rode to the top of the mountain. And they said, please, let us go. We're going to go into that. We're going into the Eretz Yisrael. We want to go to that land. We sin, Borei Olam. Moshe says, what are you doing? Why are you going against Borei Olam? You're not going to succeed. Don't go. Hashem is not with you. Well, they go up anyway. And Amalek was there. Canaan was there. And unfortunately, many of the Jews passed away. They were killed uh, by the Goyim. The Barashah continues. And it says, Vaidibam Allah Moshe, Moshe, Tell B'nai Yisrael, when they come to the land, where they're, going, where they're going to reside, that I'm going to give them, they should make korbanot. There is a ola, or a neder, made based on a vow, or a promise, or for the holidays. It says, With any korban that a person brings, he has to bring a mincha. Mincha is a fine wheat flour. He has to bring wine as well. To libate the altar, the Mizbeach. And the uh, Lanetzach Shil Shitain, it's a third of a heen, which is a measurement. And with that, there'll be Reach Nechoch Lashem. Borelam will accept such an offering. Inside on the parasha, the punishment of the nation was one day of sin for a year of punishment. And the question is what's the calculation? And what's the lesson? It's very simple. When a person comes and hurts somebody, you insult somebody, you disparage, denigrate someone, you think that it ends over there. You think that the person feels bad, he gets upset, and that's it, the action's over. Game over. But it's not true. Because that person takes that pain, and he brings it home. And the way he talks to his wife, when he's coming and suffering with pain, affects the wife. She talks to the kids, and it affects the kids. The kid goes to school the next day, and it affects the friends. And your act permeates. So yes, they sinned one day, but it didn't end there. It had ramifications unendingly. And therefore, what Elam says, you think your sin was only worth one day? Your sin did much more than that. And therefore, the effect of that day, says Bore Elam, was a one year of suffering. Bezat Hashem, if that's the way it is with Averot, imagine how great it is with the Tzvot. You do one mitzvah, and that compliment to that person, encouraging word, that tzedakah, we don't know how far it takes us. And we don't know how much sakhar we will reap. Is that the Shem in the future? Have a wonderful day. Very cool. All right. Um, here's Rabbi... Uh, 
Who do we have today? Uh, here's uh, Chabad of Iceland, Rabbi Avi Feldman. People sometimes tell me, when I'm in Israel or New York, I could be Jewish, but in a place like Iceland, it's just not possible. So this is a pretty old debate, and I'll tell you how it started. It was 3,300 years ago when the Jewish people were in the desert and they were about to conquer the land of Israel. They decided to send spies into what was then the land of Canaan to check out the land and to strategize. Forty days later, the spies returned and surprisingly, they announced that the Canaanites were too strong and that it would be impossible for the Jews to win over them. But what were the spies thinking? How could it be that the same people who witnessed the exodus from Egypt and all of the miracles that surrounded that incredible event, how could it be that these same people didn't believe in God's ability to bring the Jewish people into the land of Israel? These spies were very great people. They were the leaders of the Jewish people at the time. But they believed that Judaism could only survive in the desert. They believed that Judaism could only survive in a Jewish environment. They felt that as soon as they would go into the land of Israel, they would need to get regular jobs. They would need to live amongst other people. They would need to join society. And they felt that in that environment, it would be impossible to continue being Jewish. The truth is that Judaism could flourish wherever you are. Outside of a Jewish bubble, it requires more effort, but being Jewish is for every Jew, wherever you are. Ultimately, Judaism is about making a difference, and the greatest impact you could make is outside of the Jewish bubble. So you could be far from a large Jewish community. You could be far from friends or family. But when you do a mitzvah, you're bringing light and the warmth of Judaism to a place and to a world that needs it so much. Fantastic. Where are, we, where are we doing on time today? All right, we have time. Uh, here we go with uh, the chief rabbi of England, Rabbi Mervis. What is the Torah's antidote to an inferiority complex? In Parashat Shlach we are told how the Miraglim, the spies, returned from the Promised Land. Ten out of twelve of them delivered an evil report, and they said, when we saw the tall people living in Hebron, we appeared to ourselves as if we were grasshoppers. And that's what they also thought of us. Now, it's one thing for them to describe how they were feeling, but to presume 
that the inhabitants of Hebron viewed them as being like grasshoppers, how were they to know that? That's obviously because they felt totally inadequate and inferior at that time. On this passage, the Kotzka Rebbe remarks that they shouldn't have bothered about what the Canaanites were thinking of them. They should have concentrated on their own values and their own strengths. And let us actually have a look at the text. Let's see what Yehoshua and Kalev, the two righteous Miraglim spies said. First of all, they said to the nation, Tovaha aretz ma'od ma'od. This land is very, very good. Not just Tova, it's good. Not just Tova ma'od, it's Tova ma'od ma'od. They said, let's look on the bright side. Let's be positive. Let's see the blessings that Hashem has given us. In addition, they said to the people, Im chafetz banu Hashem otanu. It's Hashem who wants to bring us into the land. Let's trust in Him. And then they also said, Ki lachmeinu heim. They are our bread. As today we say sometimes, they are toast. We can devour them. We are strong. We have power. So therefore, here we have the Torah's four key points as it offers an antidote to an inferiority complex. First of all, don't be bothered by what you think others are thinking about you. Secondly, be positively minded. Thirdly, recognize your own strength and ability. And finally, always, trust in Hashem. Shabbat Shalom. Well, the rabbi said Hebron, so let's go to Hebron. Shalom, my friend, Simcha Hachbam of Hebron. This Shabbat abroad, we read about the story of the Miraglim, the story of Moshe sending out scouts to check out the land of Israel, to come with a report how we're going to be able to conquer the land of Israel. And some or other, the Jewish nation falls in their mission, and there they fall into a state of fright, a state of fear, and we're not going to be able to overcome the obstacles. Here they see giants. They see all types of fortified cities. And they think that Chazakum Mimeno, it's too strong for us. And we're not going to be able to overcome the challenges. But there's one exception in those scouts. And that is Kaleb Ben Yifuneh, who separates himself from all the others. And he comes to Hebron and he comes to pray at the tomb of Abraham Avinu. And we know that Kaleb is coming to pray specifically here by Avram. Avram Avinu stood up to the entire world. He was able to have that inside strength, to be able to stand on one side of the world and to talk the truth, the monotheism versus paganism. And therefore, Kalev says, I have to follow my Rebbe's footsteps and I have to be able to come and have the strength, the inside strength to stand up to the world. But Kalev teaches us something very important in our life. All of us in our own personal goals and aspirations we're faced with obstacles. We're faced with giant barriers sometimes in front of us. It looks like we can't conquer them. But Kalev gives us that inside strength to know. Allah na'ala. Diyarash no'ota. Ki yachol nuchala. We have to rise up to the challenge. We have to know that we can overcome. If we believe that God is with us, if we go with that strength of Avraham Avinu, if we believe in our mission, and we're really connected and we're in love with our mission, then we're able to overcome all the barriers, all the obstacles. We should conquer our dreams this Shabbat. We should overcome all our fears. We should be able to see the nation wipe out that sin of the Chet HaMaraklim. Shabbat Shalom. Wow. Beautiful, beautiful words. Thank you so much, Rabbi Simcha Hachbaum. All right, and let's hear from uh, Rabbi Label Wolf before we go. This week's Torah reading is Parshas Shalach, the famous episode of the 12 spies who are sent out to spy out the land of Israel before they would enter and take it over. And you and I know the story. They go there and come back with a miserable report 
of absolute pessimism. At least 10 of the 12, tri uh, of the 12, 10 of the 12 spies came back with this negative report. Why? Did they not see just recently all the miracles that Hashem had carried out for them in Egypt and in the exodus from Egypt? Did they not believe in God? The truth of the matter is they were trying to be reasonable and they recognized the fortifications in the land were too great for the Jewish people to overcome. And they knew there was a principle, a dictum, you do not rely on miracles. So they gave what they thought was an accurate report. But it was more than a report. They drew a conclusion. We can't overcome or God will not perform a miracle. They didn't recognize that when we are instructed, do something and we can't anticipate a miracle, we still must do it. Follow orders. Same in our lives. We have a certain order in our lives. We have to take initiatives. When we take initiatives, miracles will occur. At the end of the day, they did, 40 years later, take the initiative and miracles did occur. Always step forward. Don't only rest on your laurels. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Moving on to the saying of Tehillim. <clears throat> Let's go. We are going to say chapter 121 today. Let's sing it together. Right, that takes us to learning of the Tanya for today, the 23rd Tanya. of Sivan. Tanya and Fine with Rabbi Roni Fine. Hey, you for joining Tanya and Fine. Today's lesson for the 23rd of Sivan. We continue chapter 7. Chapter 7, one word is Yehuda, talking about God's unity. God's unity, the oneness of God. And as we previously learned, this includes also his knowledge. For God is the knower, the knowledge, and the known all at once. Well, by us, there are three different parts within us. In light of this, now we can understand the error that some scholars, uh, scholars in their own eyes, that is, God forgive them, have erred in misinterpreting the studying, the, the teachings, the writings of the Arizal. The Arizal is the father of modern-day Kabbalistic teachings, and he gave us the doctrine of Tzimtzum. Tzimtzum meaning contraction, God contracting himself. And they erred in understanding this to be literal. In other words, that God himself removed himself, as it were, he himself, his essence, from this world. He contracted. Why? Because if God is infinite, um, then we can have a finite world, so he needs to remove himself. And furthermore, this is a very low world, and therefore this low world uh, is something that uh, is beyond him. And uh, not, so to speak, you know, like the CEO of a corporation doesn't uh, clean the, the, the hallways. 
So in a similar manner, uh, they understood that God's essence is removed from here, and he only guides, as it, is, as it were, from above the individual providence of all created beings, somewhat like a king who is in his palace, and he's ruling from a distance. So this is the, the concept. Not that they're, you know, that God isn't in control. He's totally in control. But there is a, um, there is a reality since he has removed himself, God forbid, from this world. Now, the Alter Rebbe says the first point in, or in the, the argument against this is that if you take this Tzimtzim uh, Kipshutai, the contraction of God, literally, then that suggests that there is corporeality to God. In other words, that there is some physicality to him, and that's why he is being removed. Because either if you're here, then you remove yourself from here. In other words, if God is here, and therefore there cannot be a finite physical world because he's infinite, so you remove yourself. Well, that suggests then some form of uh, physicality. And of course, uh, we cannot say that by God, that there's any type of uh, physicality, any type of corporeality, is he is infinitely removed from that. Furthermore, the Alter Rebbe says that uh, these scholars um, are believers. They're believers, uh, sons of believers. Uh, they believe what? That God knows everything. And how does he know everything? They believe that he knows everything because his knowledge is not something added on to him, super added, a plurality, or something new that he didn't know previously. Therefore, um, the only way that could be is that he and his knowledge are one. In other words, the essence of God and his knowledge are one, and therefore that's how he knows everything. So it's not possible to suggest that he knows everything because he knowing himself, but yet he removed himself. If the knowledge is one with him, then that is not possible. <clears throat> and this is what it says in the Zohar, um, in Tikkunim, that there's no place devoid of him, not in the upper worlds, not in the lower worlds, and uh, that God is not something, not some, not uh, that we can grasp him, um, and even though he is found in this world, he is found in a way that we cannot grasp him. Um, not any, even uh, supernal intelligence can grasp the essence of God. He is hidden, hidden from all thought and from all. In other words, he fills all the worlds, and yet at the same time, he fills it, but is not affected by it. Not like the soul of man that's within the body. In other words, the fact that the soul is seamlessly one with the body uh, means that it is grasped by the body. What does it mean that it's grasped by the body? It means that if there's a change to the body, um, there's pain to the body, there's uh, cold, there's heat, fire, whatever the, uh, the case may be, it is affected by it. God, however, even though he is from within this world, he's not affected by the fact of being here, and there's no change that's brought about to him. Not summer, not winter, not day or night, nothing um, affects him. And as it says in the verse, that even the darkness does not obscure from you, and the night shines as the day. Why? Because he's not grasped within the worlds, even though he fills the worlds. And that is Tanya in 5. Thank you for joining. All right. And that brings us to Safer Mitzvahs of the Rambam. We are up to Mitzvah minute number 35. Today we again review Positive Mitzvah 215, the Mitzvah of Bris Mila, the obligation that a father has to circumcise his son when he's eight days old. With this, the list of mitzvahs in Book 2 of the Rambam is complete. However, before we move on to Book 3, those studying three chapters a day of Mishnah Torah will review over the coming days the text for the prayers that we recite throughout the entire year, weekdays, Shabbos, holidays, Rosh Hashanah, and Yom Kippur. 
Today the Rambam begins with listing all the preliminary prayers that we recite every morning before Shachris. He also goes through the text for the opening chapters of the morning prayers, as well as the text for the blessings that we recite before and after Shema, both in the morning and in the evening. We are doing so great today. All right, time for Matters of Moshiach. All right, we have learned that Mashiach will force all of Israel to follow the ways of Torah and mitzvahs. Mashiach will not use physical force. After all, it says in Mishli, Proverbs, the way of Torah is peace and pleasantness. Rather, Mashiach will teach the entire world. The truth of his teachings will be so clear that everyone will naturally accept Mashiach's teachings and follow the Torah. So, too, we need to make our Torah study so clear that we are naturally inclined to follow its directives. So, there you have it. Put into practice. Here's Shmultzmi. Shalom Aleichem, everybody. Hope all is well. This video is sponsored in honor of Shalom ben Chaim ve Olga. May his neshama have a complete aliyah. May his soul be elevated to the highest degree when he'll be right back here with us with the coming of Mashiach. Because as we know, when Mashiach comes, Hashem will resurrect the dead and bring us all of our lost ones back to us. Why is the third temple going viral? This idea of the Beis Hamikdash Shlishi, the third and final temple, is a topic that is going viral. What is going on? Why is it so famous? Well, we have to understand that this is part of the purpose of creation, just like the coming of Mashiach. The coming of Mashiach goes hand in hand with the building of the third and final temple. The third and final temple is the home of Mashiach. It is the, the synagogue of Mashiach, as they say. It's the synagogue of the world. It's the dwelling place for God in this world. What we have to understand, my friends, is that well, the first, the reason why God desires this world is because He desires a home in a physical place, a place where we have to choose Him. There are many, infinite, countless, godly realms above. We know that we're in the lowest of all realms, we're in the lowest world. And above us, there are an infinite amount of worlds, each world being infinitely more connected than God than this world in terms of their revelation of God. But in truth, there's nothing else besides God. And just this physical, lowly world is just as connected to God as the ones above. And in fact, from, to a certain, in a certain aspect, this world is the most connected, so to speak. Why? Because this is the world that God desires the most. This is the world that we get to choose God. And when we choose God, we're setting the stage for the coming Mashiach and the building of the third temple. And this will facilitate, this will cause a revelation of God infinitely greater than all the worlds above. Right now, before Mashiach arrives, this world is infinitely more hidden from God. That is so we have free will and so we can choose God. And when we get this godly revelation, we will get to experience an infinitely greater revelation of God than all the other worlds combined. Why? And in fact, this world causes revelations in the higher worlds as well. Why? Because it's like, imagine you have a best friend. You have three best friends. And then one of their best friends gets taken away from them. So of course, these two best friends are still together and they're best friends and they're infinitely at this moment closer than the other lost friend. But when this other lost friend comes back to them, he'll have an infinitely greater excitement from them than the other friend. Why? Because they were gone, they were hidden from him, and now they're reunited. So to us, and how much more so. We experience the hiddenness from Hashem. So when Hashem re-reveals himself to us, it will set the stage for a much greater revelation of God than any other realm. And this is connected to the building of the base of Mikdash. Why? Because the building of the base of Mikdash is the connecting piece, the, the gateway between heaven and earth. This is the place where heaven meets earth. It says in Tanya that the everything that exists in this world exists in heaven as well. But in heaven it is in a from different in a different form. However, the he, the Jerusalem of heaven and the Jerusalem of earth are directly adjacent to each other. What exactly does this mean? It's hard to understand, but it means that 
it means that Jerusalem and the base of Migdash are the closest place to heaven. And in fact, they are the place where heaven flows into earth. And this was specifically done at the greatest point through the base of Migdash. How can we do this? The Rebbe gives us a remedy to speed up the building of the base of Migdash. And this is actually my most viral video on YouTube with over 70,000 views to date, Baruch Hashem, where it says that when you learn about the laws of the base of Migdash, you learn about the structures. For example, you learn about the, the Levim that will guard the, the Levites, that guard the certain areas of the, the temple, and the Kohanim, which serve in different areas of the temple. And you learn about the different structures, that there was a room with, a, with an everlasting light, a, a, a constant light, the Ner Hatamid, and you learn about how the Kohanim would, would, would immerse themselves in the ritual baths, and they would purify themselves before serving, and they would wake up at a certain hour, and how the whole structure would work. When you learn about all these details, the laws of the Beis Mikdash, the Rebbe says you are building the Beis Mikdash. So in fact, by learning about the laws of the Beis Mikdash, you are building the Beis Mikdash. So if you go on Chabad.org, and I'll in fact add a link below in this video to teach you, to, uh, to give you the a link to learn about the laws of Beis Mikdash. When you do this, you build the Beis Mikdash. So again, in honor of our holy sponsor, Shalom Ben Chaim Be'oga Mehiyav and Aliyah Neshama, you too may also sponsor the Torah channel. Please email me or you can donate at the link below to help sponsor us, to help bring us the support we need to expand. We are trying to expand the Torah channel. In fact, we are already expanding the Torah channel and we're growing at ever-expanding rates with Hashem's help, of course. Please be a part of our mission to help spread God's light into the world. Thank you so much. May Hashem bless you all. May we experience this revelation today with the coming Mashiach where we'll get to feel God's presence. Basically, this is not just a building. It's not just a nice feeling, a nice spiritual place, but rather it reveals, it causes God's essence, God's essence to be connected to us. What does this mean? It causes us to connect to God Himself beyond the level of Himself. Through this, we will experience a revelation of God where the Rebbe says our eyes will see God. Our eyes will literally see godliness throughout the world. We'll get to, we'll get to see our Master. May Hashem bless you all. May we experience this today. Amen. If you'd like to contribute to Shmuel Tzvi's channel, go to shmuelzvi22 at gmail.com. And now, our PSAs. Please sponsor Food to Feed the Needy at Maspia Soup Kitchen Network. Hi, I'm Rory Weisberg, founder of Full and Free. And I'm here today to make charity giving more delicious. Thousands of families in need get food from Aspia every week and hundreds get food every day. Healthy food and sharing food is what Aspia and I have in common. That's what my cookbook and my line of products is all about. At Maspia, $10 will sponsor a hot dinner for one person. If you sponsor a donation of $180, Maspia will give you a free copy of my new cookbook. Maspia needs your help and every little bit counts. Please go to maspia.com dash Rory to make your donation and win your free copy of my book and possibly my products as well. Have a great day. Please sponsor Food to Feed the Needy at Maspia Soup Kitchen Network. Hi, I'm Rory Weisberg, founder of Full and Free, and I'm here today to make charity giving more delicious. Thousands of families in need get food from Maspia every week and hundreds get food every day. Healthy food and sharing food is what Maspia and I have in common. That's what my cookbook and my line of products is all about. I have no idea why that repeated. All right. Maspia Soup Kitchen Food Pantry. Bill, but that's worth two. That's two, six, eight, seven, nine. Seven days worth of pantry food and hot meals every day. For a parcel of Boston County. It's tomcheshabbos.org, tomcheshabbos.org. And in Lakewood, it's tomche.org. In Chicago, it's the Chicago Center Kitchen at breakfastwithelli.live slash Chicago Food Bank. For all your other needs, go to Achiezer, achiezer.org at 516-791-4444. They are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Hatsala, hatsala.org is available also on the 24-7 spectrum. EMS service, no matter where you live, Hatsala is available. Go to hatsala.org worldwide. If you don't have Hatsala in your neighborhood, contact them or me, and we'll make sure that we get one started for you. We have two Hatsala ambulances here in Riverdale alone. If you are not good, the victim of it, you see a hate crime in progress, please, 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 please call 911, no matter whether it's Shabbos or Yom Tov, any time of the day, any time of the night, you must report these crimes so that 
the authorities can take care of wiping it out because that's really important. In times of bereavement, please contact Ms. Askim. MissAskim.org is there to help you out at 718-854-4548, 718-854-4548, or at MissAskim.org, M-I-S-A-S-K-I-M.org. JustOneShabbos.com, a project Sohar Kiru organization will host a group of secular Israelis for an unforgettable Shabbos experience. Inspire a teenager to come back to the joys of keeping Shabbos. Donate to Just One Shabbos today. Where are so, mask? Where a mask? As we said, the Broadway League is ask. Tie not some fabric required your face. to wear masks oh, the as of July of July 1st. The but gym, the CDC the is still suggesting that we like do it. All right. When it comes to matters of health, questions of a person's sakonis nefashas endangering their lives, especially in areas where you don't know people's vaccination status, wearing a mask is super, super important. And please, 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 please let's get vaccinated, okay? Vaccinations help save lives. Even those people who are getting sick now, even those that are vaccinated are getting sick, but it's not serious and they're not going to the hospital. So that's what the vaccinations are doing for you. They're protecting you, okay? For today, the 23rd day of Sivan, any matter effective towards or leads to divine service of Voda and is confronted with opposition of any sort, even the most noble, that opposition is the scheming of the Nefesh Bahamas, the animal soul, as we learned earlier today. Bring heaven down to earth. The common conception of how the system works is faulty. People see a career as making a living. A career doesn't make anything. What you receive is generated above in the spiritual realm. Your business is to set up a channel to allow all that to flow into the material world. Yep, you have to make the vessel. You want to discuss that more? Come to me at any of the Actors Rabbis groups at WhatsApp, Twitter, Spaces, Telegram, Facebook, Instagram, Spotify Live, LinkedIn, Racket, Clubhouse, or at theactorsrabbi.com. I always feel like I'm saying the uh, Ten Sons of, uh, of You Know Who uh, in the Megillah when I do that, because I try to do it in one breath. I don't know why. At theactorsrabbi.com, you can take care of signing up for life coaching services. Make an appointment today. Our fees are on a sliding scale for when you can afford it. All right, let's make an after bracha, thanking Hashem for that breakfast that we had. Baruch ato Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Boirei Nefashois Rabois Vechesreinan Al koil ma she borosa la chayois boem Nefesh kol chai boruch all right, I cannot thank you enough for being here. Thank you for listening on Clubhouse, guys. Uh, it was really a pleasure, boys and girls and others. Uh, thank you for listening on uh, Spotify Live, especially for Don Texas, who's been there almost the whole time. Thank you. Um, we are here every day from 10 to about 11, 15, 11, 30, depending on how long we go. Um, we are here every day, Sunday through Friday. We don't broadcast on Shabbos and Yom Tov. Thank you to my Patreon sponsors, Pest Pro Riddle, Tarzane Orcas, Dina D. Design, Dr. Susan Spitzer, Bracha Biederman. You can become a sponsor today by going to patreon.com slash theactorsrabbi or to our virtual tip jar at breakfastwithelli.live slash tip jar or use the handy QR code on this page over here. We broadcast to 12 different platforms simultaneously thanks to LinkedIn and Ecamm. If you would like to live stream yourself, contact me 
and become an ECAM subscriber today. We'll both get something out of it. Go out and do something nice, something good for someone today. In the words of Rabbi Zakamla, have affection for a fellow. Hashem will have affection for you. Do a kindness for a fellow. Hashem will do a kindness for you. Befriend a fellow. And Hashem will befriend you. You know what? Yesterday I was so in, um, I was so inspired uh, by Prokios Anach. We played a little clip. They did a cover of it. That I decided to go back and find the original and hear Mordechai ben David with the Freilach band uh, and the Shira choir doing um, his original rendition of Proit Yas Onach. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful song. Enjoy this. Come back tomorrow with at least one more person to watch or listen. And uh, we'll see you then, Thursday, Rabbi Sachs. Enjoy. Yes.